Thank you, Patsy. Let's open our Bibles, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 6 in verse 4. We'll start there. I want to begin a series of messages today on the Holy Spirit of God. And uh, this statement in Deuteronomy 6.4 is a good starting point. You say, well, you read this verse, it doesn't even refer to the Holy Spirit. Well, I just want you to see this statement. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So the Bible makes it abundantly clear there is one God, just one. And it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts and press them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. But he says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one and you're to love him with all your heart, all your mind and all your soul. Well, the Bible as it teaches that, also teaches this, that the one God reveals himself as three persons, his Father, his Son, and his Holy Spirit. And the word Trinity is used in, in church circles, but the word Trinity is never found in the Bible. And so many people, they struggle with this, certainly people who are not in the faith, they cannot accept this at all. And people who are believers. Some get it in their mind, well, we have actually three gods. There's the Father, and there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one God, one God who reveals himself as three different persons. And we want to start this study about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, look, I know it's beyond our comprehension. To be able to explain, you cannot explain this particular teaching or doctrine of the Bible, but there are many things about God that a person cannot explain, and that should not be a surprise to us. Uh, we cannot comprehend, we cannot fathom to say that God is all-knowing, that He's all-powerful, that He's all-present, that He's eternal, that He's always been. When I spoke to some of our children, third, fourth, and fifth graders a couple of Wednesdays ago, the question was, it came back, well now, when did God start? And who made God? Well, nobody made God. God has always been. You can't wrap your mind around that and explain it. But it's so very important that we understand the truth about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, just as we understand truth about the Lord Jesus and about God the Father. Well, first of all, I just want us to think, where in the Bible does it teach that this one God that we read of in Deuteronomy that He actually is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He reveals Himself in three persons. Well, let me give you some examples and look over in Genesis. Where would it teach that the Holy Spirit is indeed divine, that He is a part of this triune nature of God? Well, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, it says this, as God was involving Himself in the work of creation, and now He's about to make man, it says, God said, let us. Not, I think I will. He said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. But let us make man in our image. Let us do this in our likeness. Well, now, who's that us? That's not God and the angels because the angels are not in the image of God. That's not God and human beings because no human being's been made as of yet. Let us make man in our image. It's talking about God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One God, but all, all are referred to. Let us make man in our image. And you thought, well, I don't see any real reference here to the Spirit. Well, look over here in Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, The earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Who's that Spirit? What's that talking about? That's a reference to the Holy Spirit of God. The second verse in the Bible, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The fact that it refers to of God refers to the divine nature of the Spirit. And then you come to the New Testament. 
In the New Testament, in John 16, Jesus, in chapter 14, 15, and 16, and we'll see this as we get into our study, He spends a lot of time talking about the Holy Spirit. But in John chapter 16 and verse 7, Jesus says this. He's told His followers He's about to leave the world. And the disciples are very upset about this, very much concerned. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is to your good, to your advantage that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But when I go, I will send him to you. But Jesus says this, it is to your advantage that I go away. Because unless I go away, the counselor, and that's a reference to the Holy Spirit, he will not come to you. Now, the point is just this. If the counselor, the Holy Spirit, is lesser than Jesus, he's not the equivalent of Jesus, he's not divine as Jesus was divine, then it's not to our advantage if someone lesser than Christ comes. But Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go away, because if I go not away, then the Comforter cannot come. But when He comes, He's going to do unique things. And this really is the Spirit of Christ. You think, well, why is that to our advantage? Well, when Jesus is here in bodily form, He cannot be with every single one of us. He can't. Martha and Mary were with their brother Lazarus, and they called for Jesus. Jesus was in another place. Now, He came to them, but He wasn't with them right then. But Jesus says, here's the advantage when I go away. The Spirit, my Spirit, He's going to come, and one of the things about the Spirit of God, He is with us. He is in us, and He never leaves us. He doesn't have to be in one place and can't be in another, and then He has to leave that place and come to another. No, He's right here with us. We're all believers. Wherever they are today assembling, the Spirit of God is there in the lives of those believers, and it's a tremendous advantage. But that points out the fact that Christ says it's to your advantage. The Spirit of God has to have the divine nature or it would not be to our advantage at all. And then in Acts chapter 5 in verses 1 through 11, when it talks about the beginning work of God in the early church and here are people, they are giving their gifts to the ministry and Ananias and Sapphira, they're business people, they had a piece of property and they sold their property but they didn't bring all of it, but they wanted credit for bringing all of it. So they kept back some from themselves, and they came to the apostles and said, here's all we have. And look what it says in the, these verses. Look in verse 4. Acts chapter 5 and verse 4. In fact, let's still go to verse 3. It says, Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, and have kept for yourself some of the money which you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold, and after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? Now look, he said up in verse 3, you have lied to the Holy Spirit, but look what he says here. He says, Ananias, you've not lied to men. You've lied to God. When you lie to the Holy Spirit, you are lying to God. And when Ananias heard this, he fell down and he died. And great fear seized all who heard this. And then three hours later, his wife comes in. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you and Ananias got for the land? She said, yes, that's the price. And he said, how could you agree to test the Spirit of the Lord? And then she died. But he said, when you lie to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God. So in the Bible, Old and New Testament, it refers to the deity of the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28, in verse 19, when Jesus talked about baptism, and this is why I say this every time I baptize, and other ministers do, I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And why in the world I say that? Just something to repeat? No. Jesus in the Great Commission, in Matthew 28, He said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto Me. He told His followers, I want you to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So all portions of the triune God are referred to when a person is baptized. Jesus told us to do that because 
This is the nature of God. But the Holy Spirit, when you think of Him, He is God. Now, what difference does that make for you and for me? And you'd think, well, no one who's a believer would ask that question, but I assure you that they do. Uh, the Holy Spirit of God by many is just not even considered. Now, I'm talking about church people. Uh, some people who have attended church have never even heard of the Holy Spirit. They don't even speak. They don't teach about Him. They don't deal with this issue, this aspect of God. They don't, they don't have the first notion about the Holy Spirit, about what He does, that He's even in the world. That he's even within them. In fact, if you have some beliefs, where does Jesus Christ live in my life? They, they may know enough to say, well, he lives in my heart, meaning he lives in me. Well, then you throw this out to him and say, well, how does he do that? Because instead he ascended unto heaven and he's at the right hand of the Father. So how in the world, if he's at the right hand of the Father, how does he live in your life? Well, then you get some blank stares. Listen, the way he lives in you is through the Holy Spirit. In the Bible in Colossians, when it says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. Well, Christ through His Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, lives within our lives. And yet there's some people that haven't even heard of Him. Some hear this term because you can see preachers on television. And how many of you have heard this statement? What we need here is a Holy Ghost revival. And those statements are made and... and People in the public who hear that and, and many who are in church, they hear that Holy Ghost revival. They think, man, that sounds kind of weird. Holy Ghost revival? It just seems strange to them. And then there are believers who are just not interested in even delving into this subject. Policy. Here's what they're satisfied to know. Here's all I want you to tell me. You just tell me that God loves me, that He's forgiven me, and that He's given me eternal life. And that's all I need to know. That's it. God loves me. He's forgiven me. I have life that's everlasting. Well, listen, if that was all you needed to know or I needed to know, God never would have inspired all the teachings in the Scripture that He inspired. We need to know much more than that. The fact is, you and I do immeasurable harm to our lives when we are not acquainted with the work of the Holy Spirit of God within us and what the Holy Spirit does. And we allow Him to do this work. We're hurting ourselves greatly. It would be like an individual. What would you think of this? What if some person had in the years past, someone gave them a million dollars and it was put into an account for them and they had access to it. There it was. And yet somehow, some way, they forgot that they had that money or they just ignored they had that money. And so the whole of their life, they live as a pauper. It just barely eating, just barely getting by, struggling for an existence. And they had all those resources available to them, but they just ignored and just forgot. You'd think, how pitiful. How tragic that would be. I'll tell you, it's much worse when a believer ignores the work of the Holy Spirit of God and here they struggle day after day, month after month, year after year, trying to deal with temptation, trying to be the person that they want to be but they can't be. And they're living the life of a spiritual pauper when they have a whole tremendous resource in the Spirit of God that could dramatically change their lives if they just let now listen, getting back to this question, what difference does it make? Well, I'll tell you, it makes all the difference in your life as to what you know of the Holy Spirit of God. Just these things to name a few, and we'll be looking at this in other messages. The assurance of your salvation, the knowledge that you have of Jesus Christ, the power for Christian living and service and witness, the discovery and use of your spiritual gifts, to be comforted in your life when you have traumatic times, to have hope instilled in you, to have healing brought upon your life. Hey, you don't have any of that if the Holy Spirit of God is not doing a work in your life and you're not allowing Him to do that work. So it makes all the difference. Now, the final thing I just want to talk to you about this morning is the Holy Spirit's work in salvation. And this is not going to be exhaustive. I just want to mention two things here real quick to you. The Holy Spirit's work in our salvation. Are you aware of this? No one could be saved if the Holy Spirit did not do His work in your life. Do you know that? No one could be saved. 
And there are believers so ill-informed that they disagree with that. In fact, some may think right here in this room that you're being blasphemous when you say that because all that's needed for us to be saved is Jesus Christ dying on a cross for our sins, coming forth from the grave, conquering death, and then we receive Jesus into our life. That's all that's required for me to be saved. Now, there's truth in all those statements. I'm not disputing that, not in the least. Jesus had to die on the cross for our sins, take the punishment for our sins. And it was a grievous experience for him. When the Bible says that he was in Gethsemane and that the Lord Jesus, he makes a comment before he goes in to his disciples, he said, I was grieved and I am grieved to the point of death. I'm deeply distressed. Don't you read that and think Jesus Christ for one second was afraid of dying. Well, that's not the point. He was grieved to the point of death because he knew what was fixing to happen to him when he was on that cross. The sins of the world were going to be placed upon him and he was going to take the punishment for those sins. After he had his time of prayer, for someone to say, oh, he's afraid of death, just so frightened of death, Jesus walks out of Gethsemane and when that crowd comes up to him, he said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, well, that's who I am. Peter gets upset, cuts off the slave of the high priest here. Jesus heals the man. Jesus lets them take him into this place, into the city, where they try him unjustly. He said to his disciples, he said, By the way, I don't have to go through this. If I want to, I can call for 72,000 angels, six leg 12 legions of angels right now, and they would come to me instantaneously. I can wipe all these people out. But he doesn't do that. He goes in. They beat him. You don't read of Jesus crying, begging for mercy, not in the least. He's the most courageous person that's ever lived. He gets to the cross. When he's on the cross, he's not like other people who were crucified, begging, please get me off this cross. No, he looks out over the crowd and says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Shows forgiveness to the repentant thief. Shows concern for his mother. He has that moment when the weight of the world comes in upon him and says, My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? But then he comes back he says, It is finished. Meaning I've paid for the sins of the world. And then he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he had already told his followers, In three days I'm coming back. So don't you for one second, I don't care who says it to you, Jesus was afraid of dying. They don't have a clue what they're talking about. He certainly was not. He died on that cross for our sins. He had to do that. He came forth from the grave. He conquered death. That was necessary. That paves the way for salvation. You and I, we have to ask Him into our life if we're going to be saved. But now listen real closely to me. If the Spirit of God had not done His work in our lives, even though Jesus had died on the cross and come forth from the grave, we could not be saved. You think, how could you possibly say that? For these reasons. The Spirit of God must do these two things for sure for us to be saved. One, He must convict us of our sins. The Bible says there needs to be conviction. We must have it. Look what it says in John chapter 16. Jesus gives His teaching. John chapter 16. In verses 8 and following. After Jesus tells him, it's to your advantage that I go away, he, he tells why. He says, when, the, when he comes, the counselor, the Holy Spirit comes, here's what he's going to do. He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. But the Holy Spirit must bring this conviction. If the Holy Spirit did not do a convicting work in your life and my life when we're lost, we would never come to Christ. There are scores of people out here who don't even believe that sin is that bad. They don't think sin separates them from God. They don't understand about a perfect God, a holy God. How He abhors sin. How He will judge sin. That's why Jesus said the Spirit of God is here to do this. He's to convict you of sin and of righteousness. what God's standard of righteousness is. And of judgment. Because sin is going to be judged. 
but that conviction must take place in our lives. Let me show you something over here in Acts. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2. When Peter's preaching at Pentecost, there's a little statement. Acts chapter 2, in verse 37. Here he talked pointedly to them about Christ and his death on the cross and what they had done and Jesus conquering death. And he says this in verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now look in verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said, Well, you've got to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And don't read that and think, well, now you have to be baptized to be saved. He's saying repent and be baptized because of the remission of your sins. Baptism is an indication that you've met Christ and a symbol of what he's done for us in his death and resurrection. And he says, then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, now where it says right there that they were cut in their heart, you think Simon Peter did that? You think Simon Peter was just so persuasive, so powerful, so so unusual in his ability to speak that he could penetrate the hearts of people, their souls, their spirit, and bring conviction to them. He couldn't do that. I can't do that. No preacher. If you, if you look and say, oh, man, that preacher, that guy really brings conviction. That, all that guy can do is deliver God's message. Who in the world brings that conviction to a person's life? the Holy Spirit of God. If he did not do that work, there's not one single person that would be convicted of their sin. The Holy Spirit does this work. We can't be saved unless he does that work. But then there's something else. It's not just the convicting part of it. There's something else. We have to be drawn to the Lord. Look what it says in John chapter 6 and verse 44. Jesus makes this statement. The Lord Jesus said, John 6 and verse 44. He says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. But no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Listen, it's not just convicting us of sin, but there is this drawing. God has to draw. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless my Father draws him. The desire to come to Christ. I mean, it's not enough just to be convicted of your sin and be sorry for your sin, but there's this attitude of repentance. I want to turn. I want to go to Him. Well, you can't do that on your own. This notion that some people have that, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do what I want to do, live my life. I'm pretty healthy now. Things are going my way in life. And I know one day I think I need to give my life to Jesus. I've heard people say that. And one day later on in my life, I'll give my life to Christ. Please listen to me. You don't set the terms of this. You don't make that decision. You can only come as God draws you. If He doesn't draw you, you can't come. And you can say any little prayer you want to say, but if God is not drawing, then a person can't come to be saved. Well, now God does draw, but how does He do that? How does He reach into our life and draw us? It's through the Holy Spirit of God. God's Spirit. He reaches into your heart. And He he encourages you. He convicts you. He invites you. He creates that desire within you. Listen, I can really, a lot of people say, oh, I don't know about these little kids. I can remember as a, a child, I was saved when I was seven. And for a few months, my mother and father, they took me in to talk to the, to the preacher. And uh, I'd go to Sunday school, and we'd sit towards the back. And every Sunday, I didn't hear that much what the pastor said. But when it came time for the invitation. In my life, as a little boy, I thought there was this, I knew that I'd done things wrong. And there was this drawing. And I didn't know what was going on, but I thought that. Week after week. And when the invitation was over, 
I'd go home, sometimes I'd think about it, but a drawing wasn't always there. And I remember on one Sunday, my mother met me outside after Sunday school, and she said, well, Lee is going down today. And Lee was my best friend, my next door neighbor. And uh, when the invitation came, he started. And I didn't go because he did. But his going gave me encouragement to go. And that same feeling as we drew close to that time, this conviction, I knew I'd done wrong. I knew I needed Christ and I surrendered to that and I didn't I don't even remember saying a prayer but I just know in my heart I'm saying here's my life but what was going on in me as a little child what goes on in somebody like Cadence what goes on in an adult a teenager that brings him to this place who does that drawing it's the Holy Spirit of God it is the Holy Spirit of God so listen, when you start thinking about, well, I don't know that we need this study so much. Oh, we need it. And we can just know this. If the Holy Spirit did not do this work of conviction and this work of drawing, even though Jesus died on the cross and arose from the grave, no one could be saved. Jesus knew that to be true. The Spirit of God is here to point people to Christ and to draw people to Him. And that's why any time we enter this place or any time we're going to talk to someone about Jesus, we need to always be praying, Lord, I know that my words are not sufficient. So, Lord Jesus, I pray with your spirit that you're going to work in this neighbor's life, work in this family member's life, when in this congregation, Lord, work in the lives of people here this morning. Listen, I don't know everything that's going on in the lives of people here. But I know this, even though I've just spoken about salvation, the Spirit of God can be speaking to some people in here who are already saved that have other needs in their life. And He can draw you and point you back to Christ for your healing, for your restoration, for your hope, for your comfort. But some in this room who've never given their lives to Christ listen, my, my only hope in standing up here delivering a message is the fact that I do know this. When God's Word is shared, God's Spirit will speak. And He's speaking to some of you. And if it's for salvation, if you've never trusted in Christ, you may be as an adult or a teenager in that same position I was in when I was a little boy. And deep inside, you know I had sinned. And there's that desire, that drawing. I need to do this. And you may fight that. I'm telling you, that's God's Spirit. He's drawing you. If you're going to come to Christ, you need to come when He's doing that work because you can't come at any other time. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we cannot comprehend all about you and, and your magnificence and your greatness, your splendor. We, we can't. And Father, even this teaching about here's one God that reveals himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. Father, we can't explain it, but we'd be very foolish to deny it because the, the Bible makes it abundantly clear. And Lord Jesus, I just thank you right now that your Spirit, whom you sent, is in this place. And he lives in all the believers here, but Father, there are people here who have never trusted in Christ. And Father, I thank you. I can remember, even though that was so many years ago, that work that you did in my life. And I thank you that you're doing that work right now. And I pray for people that have not trusted in you, that, Lord Jesus, they would not say no to you. Help them to yield themselves to you. Help them to give up this fight and come and say, Jesus, here I surrender my life. And, Father, it may be this. It may be there are believers here who just really wandered away from you. And, Holy Spirit, I thank you that you work in the lives of believers like that to convict and to draw them back. And I pray that you do that in their life. And Father, there's some in here that just need comfort and they need hope. And I just pray with your spirit that you instill that within them and flood their life with a comfort and peace 
that only you can give through your spirit. But Lord, you have your will and your way in the life of every person in this room right now. And Lord Jesus, I ask this in your name. While our heads are still bowed and our eyes are closed, we will have a closing song, but after that song's over, some people will be leaving the building. But listen, this could be the most important time in the service for you because it is a time of invitation. I can stand here and invite you, but listen, more importantly, the Spirit of God invites you, and He draws you. And if you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus, and you'd like to make that commitment today, that's a hunger of your heart. I'm just going to ask you to come forward publicly. As soon as we finish this song, I'll be glad to talk with you. We'll have others down here that can assist you. And we can share with you. You can receive Jesus today. It might be that you're a believer, and you just need somebody to pray for you. Things are going on in your life, and you need prayer. If that's true, we hope you'd come. Or it might be that you're a believer, and you're looking for a church home, and you need that. The church, it's Jesus's. It's nobody else's. It's a family. We need a spiritual family. If you feel like this is where the Lord wants you to be, we hope you'd come. God's Spirit can draw you in that commitment. But God bless you, whatever decision you make today. And I thank you for being here this morning. Hope you can be back for Focus Group tonight. Lord bless you.